this is a, a, a picture that um, my colleagues at yours have, uh, I think my friend, uh, developed for the front of the report, and I, and I was a little, um, uh, at first I said, well, it's kind of busy in the background. I said, I can get my staff to Photoshop out the background. And then I realized, and, and Mayor said, no, we like the background. And, and I thought about it, and I said, well, there's the hand. You know, so this is a, a kind of a rare case where the hand behind the measuring, the hand doing the measuring, is is highlighted. So I was, uh, uh, I really understood kind of the importance of the cover. <laughs> um, I just need to say that this is really uh, the, the report that's my own views and not your stat of uh, the Massachusetts Institute or MIT. I'll just say, but it, at MIT, you can you can blame them. Um, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna. Uh, I have a lot to get through today. When I put this slide together, I was dismayed because I knew I would never um, kind of be able to uh, get through all of this. So I'll have to go very, very quickly. Uh, but luckily, uh, Professor Brennan um, did a fantastic job of kind of setting the stage. And the first, you know, section of the report really is the background. It's kind of what's why is this important now? How are the, how have things changed in the global economy? That would require uh, changes to the production um, of statistics. So, uh, thank you, Professor Brent, for, for doing that. And then I'll kind of walk through how um, I, I did a kind of uh, kind of very coarse uh, assessment of the European statistical system, which is extremely complicated and, and baroque in many ways. But um, how I, I, I tried to make sense of that as best I could, uh, and then kind of walk through uh, some of the conclusions. Um, and uh, the recommendations and the priorities going forward. So the background really is you know, talking about this idea of international, internationalization to globalization. You know, internationalization has been around a long time. Um, consists of you know, arms length trade uh, on one hand and the kind of uh, inter intra firm trade in multinational organizations. Uh, you're driven by foreign direct investment. So these are things that are, have uh, pretty good uh, statistical uh, underpinnings. Uh, they've been around for a long time, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rademacher talked a lot about, and, and very well, about you know, why and how those systems have come into place, and how their limitations have become uh, clear lately. Um, but when we move into this kind of uh, the era of economic globalization, it really is it's pretty simple. Um, There's really just um, uh, a kind of additional mechanism that I can see. Um, so you have this complexity uh, in international trade and foreign direct investment, more countries, uh, new business models, fragmentation of the value chain, but these are basically the same phenomenon um, that are kind of more complex. But in terms of global sourcing, this is something that I've been studying for a long time, which is um, uh, really this kind of non-affiliated trade, and and which is different than arm's length trade because it consists of a lot of the of the elements that happen inside a multinational firm. So you have a supplier um, in a, in a foreign country that you are providing with a host of, of information and requirements uh, uh, for um, if it's even in manufacturing or services, it doesn't matter. Um, that um, speed speed up the the flow of, of, of information and goods flows in the economy in the global economy, and also require kind of knowledge assets that uh, that are not required with arm's length trade. And I think one of the big uh, points that we focus on is the kind of change is technological changes, what we call value chain modularity. So this has two elements, first computerization um, in uh, design, but also production, logistics, um, in the kind of tying together of, of, of spatially distributed business processes. And then also, you know, you, you, you can kind of put things into ICT system, but the, the system is still pretty clunky and slow unless you have standardization. The systems have to be able to talk to each other. Uh, and this is kind of the idea of both de facto and uh, de jure standards, where everybody's kind of on the same system, or there's industry associations uh, or even government agencies that, that get people together to agree on um, international standards. And in a sense, 
this is a process that also are, that is ongoing in, in statistics. So in the UN, we, uh, uh, Ronald Jansen's here today, and his what he does most of the time is this process of developing de, uh, de jure standards in, in statistics, and that's very uh, it, it's a difficult process of kind of balancing out the different interests in the room, but it's absolutely um, essential for, for global interoperability, both in businesses and statistics. So we're seeing um, kind of uh, new technologies, uh, <coughs> radio frequency ID tags uh, for in the logistics systems, and the internet in general as a kind of platform for, um, for global integration. So, um, <clears throat> You have the big trend towards outsourcing, uh, beginning in the 1990s, uh, fo companies focusing on core competencies. And in, in rich countries, it really it was a, a focus on uh, getting rid of fixed assets and focusing on variable assets as a way to protect themselves in financial markets. And that essentially meant getting rid of manufacturing. Um, so shedding fixed costs and keeping variable costs um, uh, in response to uh, pressure from the financial markets, what we call financialization, uh, some people do. Um, so we, uh, in this process of outsourcing, we see, saw the rise of a new global supply base. So multinationals, not just at the top of the value chain, not just the branded firms, but asking their suppliers to be everywhere um, in large scale to support, uh, support them. So when you talk about intra-firm trade, it's not just kind of Ford and GM and IBM, and but it's uh, Flexonics and Foxconn and, and all of the service providers. Um, uh, you can even look at kind of consult, global consulting firms and um, clinical trial uh, companies uh, providing services for clients on a global basis. So this is a big change. And I do a lot of work on international development. And, and international development um, countries are very much desperate to get into global value chains as, as a way to learn and to, uh, to upgrade. And one way to do that was to attract FDI and then get your local suppliers to work for the part affiliate. Well, now you, know, you have big companies at, at each level of, of the supply chain, and that's much harder. But in a sense, from a statistical point of view, it's easier because you have, you have a lot less fragmentation. You have a lot of consolidation in the whole, in a, at each level of the value chain. So um, and I'll talk later about trying to get private data into the, into the uh, statistical system. But you have a handful of companies in the world. I think that if you took out the top, what, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 companies in the world, world, we would not be having this meeting. The, world, the word globalization, global value chains wouldn't be brought up. So that, in that, there's an opportunity. <clears throat> At the same time, it's not just a kind of developed country game anymore, and there are capabilities uh, in low-cost geographies. Big companies, we talked to, Professor Brennan talked about South-South FDI, uh, companies like Huawei and ZTE that are being uh, are successful in global markets, for example, and are making big investments in, uh, in places like Africa uh, and Brazil and other places in the South. <clears throat> trade infrastructure has matured. Um, some of the best trade infrastructure is in places uh, like China. Uh, uh, finance and government capability. There's a big push to get bigger and bigger pieces of the pie. There's a sophisticated understanding of that smiling curve where we don't want to just be at the bottom anymore. We want some of we want the high value stuff. So if you think about trade and services, um, putting pressure on not folks in factories, but folks in office buildings, um, you can see that um, there's a, a pretty uh, an interesting game at foot. So it does include services. Now if you kind of add services to the pile, whether they're services and similar to manufacturing or created by manufacturing or not, it's a big part of the economy. So uh, you have a kind of the field for globalization doubling in the beginning by the opening of uh, the formerly closed economies, the transition economies, uh, and then maybe doubling again with the opening of services to uh, global value chains. Okay, so let's get to the heart of the matter. Um, you know, why do we need better statistics? I'll just put all these up. You know, um, first we have to know kind of what's going on. We have to be able to characterize the process. And to do that, we have to know 
how firms are structured and, uh, and what they're doing. Uh, we need to know how pervasive it is and uh, what the trends are. Now, the, um, some of the data that uh, Dr. Rodermach put up, and um, uh, Nadine will talk later about the international input-output databases, are kind of giving answers to those questions. But from a very top-down perspective, and um, with a lot of estimation techniques that are um, uh, you know, well-known and, and robust in a sense, but are not kind of based on um, detailed enterprise data, we need to close that gap. Um, to answer, you know, the kind of holy grail of the question is that what's the effect of all of this unemployment? Um, Professor Brennan talked about how people say that it's having an effect on employment, but, you know, people say a lot of things. And with, with, if you don't have data, you can pretty much say whatever you want. It's, it's a great thing for employment. It's kind of shifting us to higher value uh, 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 activities, or it's decimating the middle class or it's getting rid of kind of any job ladder. We just don't know. And without the statistics, people, this debate will continue to be pretty crude uh, and very polarized. It's, it's much more so in my country in the United States, where people can and do say pretty much anything they want about the effect of globalization on employment and income. <clears throat> and then innovation. So if you think about global value chains, and you think about the fragmentation of the chain, you have the innovative pieces uh, over here, and you have the kind of routine things over here. Well, that just changes the way we think about innovation, about capturing the gains from innovation. Does innovation create a lot of employment, or does it just create a lot of uh, kind of wealth at the top? <coughs> Again, coming back to that employment question, if you look at a, a company like Apple that employs about 30,000 people in the U.S. with the kind of highest market capitalization in the world, um, you know, in the old days, that would have been GM. So you really have to think about uh, the effects of innovation. And without kind of detailed statistics about where innovations are kind of realized, where the value is actually kind of added and then captured, um, and then where it's distributed, I mean, this is the other question about where do the profits go? Um, and how are they accounted for, um, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to answer questions like that. So, just talk a little bit, that kind of, this is all in the report, and I'm going to go through this very, very quickly because it's there in black and white, um, uh, and it's really kind of how I personally try to make sense of something as, again, as complicated and broke as the European statistical system, uh, how I kind of, like the filter I kind of poured that through. So I used the value chain concept as the beginning, a very, very simplified version, uh, just four steps. Um, most, most trade is kind of uh, inside the chain anyway, is, is happening in this kind of supply chain portion. When people talk about supply chains and value chains, and this is kind of how I see it. They're not the same thing, they're related. We can talk more about that, but that's not a talk for today. But obviously, this is much more complicated, even at the output side. So you really have, you know, partially a cycle here, and, and views, and you know, arguably, um, and economists will argue this very powerfully, is that most of the value is captured by the user. So you know, I paid nothing for my my old iPhone three four years ago. I'm still using it. It's fine. I pay my bill every every month to uh, my carrier, but um, who paid for the phone? But I can argue that I captured more value from this than Apple did. Okay, so um, getting into the kind of international sourcing piece, um, really, you know, companies have these these four choices for everything they do. If you look at the idea of fragmentation and for competence, for every single piece of work, you know, managers need to make, and this is, these are kind of uh, uh, strategic decisions, what, what, do you, what do you do, where do you get the work done? Do you do it in-house, uh, domestically, uh, do you set up a foreign affiliate or move it to a foreign affiliate that already exists, do you outsource it domestically, or do you do this kind of uh, external international sourcing? And it's not just a, a, a a single choice, but these modes of sourcing are mixed. So right now, if you look at the International Sourcing Survey coming out of Eurostat, 
It's very crude, right? It says, do you do international sourcing or not? But we really don't know how much, because actually companies, as part of your strategy is to keep some in-house, um, outsource some to an independent supplier so you can kind of know the process and kind of understand if you're being taken, uh, uh, being ripped off or not, you know, these types of things. So there's a, and there's also a question of, and Professor Brennan talked about some, of, some things coming back to high wage economies. Well, this is constantly in flux. So obviously FDI is kind of occurs when um, uh, through this foreign affiliate process. So then you kind of build up the system. So you have a supply chain and for, for each activity in the supply chain. And again, this is a very simplified ch supply chain with a value chain with four steps. You have four, four sourcing decisions for each one of those. But if you fragment it into the real kind of value chain, uh, of very kind of, uh, uh, and you break it up much more finely. And the international sourcing survey has eight business functions, in, 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 in addition to the um, the kind of main output, uh, the production function, if you will. Um, you know things like IT services, uh, management, um, facilities maintenance, transportation. These types of functions that that kind of make the firm work can also be outsourced and or offshore in some cases. So it's a much more complicated value chain, in fact. But for each, the point is, for each uh, function, there are these four choices, and the international sourcing surveys kind of get at these sources. Um, and again, there, need, there needs to be a way to quantify the information that's collected and not just check off a binary box. It gets into a whole subject about the quality of data um, and where the data comes from. And I think historically, the expectation by fiscal agencies is that the respondent would go into their books and copy down out of the book into the form. You know, this is the way it's set up. International sourcing surveys, you know, are basically using concepts that managers use in their head, and you have to just ask for their best estimate. You have to, so it's all about the quality of the responded, and I think it's a different kind of mindset for, uh, oops, for, uh, for, for statisticians. Okay, is to kind of flexibly, is to open up the box a little bit. Because when you think about the estimations that are going on, on the, on the input-output side and the I-I-O side. Um, and then you kind of come back and say, well, we're going to adhere to the standard where every single thing is accounted for in real out of some of these books. Things like services, ex externally sourced services, where companies don't necessarily even keep track of it. They'll have a, a big, because it's not required for, for the tax purposes, you know, maybe it should be, it, it's not broken out. So they'd have a big, a big category for purchase services. You don't know what they are. You don't know where they're sourced. So I mean, and the, and the companies may not either. But the managers know. The top manager, you ask them kind of in a general flavor about business functions. You know, where are you getting them? Um, and, and, the, and the data that's been collected so far in this way has looked pretty good from an intuitive point of view. All right, I'm using up uh, all my time just to point out. You know, again, the complexity. It's not just what you're doing in your country. You know, as Dr. Lodebacher pointed out. It's a global system. So you have companies in both in your compiling country and your GVC partner co country making the same choices. Okay, for, so, so we have very little information about, um, about this kind of sourcing in, in, you know, in a bi-directional way. And then when you add in the kind of, again, more reality, you know, you're having, you have dozens and dozens of trading partners. So, um, I use this kind of model to, and you won't be able to see this, and that's fine, um, but the kind of colored uh, text inside of the, each quadrant um, kind of is a way to kind of identify the statistical resources uh, in Europe uh, for each that would kind of shed some light. And there's some, there's, and I broke them down into existing uh, experimental uh, data sources and kind of just things that aren't there. Um, and, and it's a little misleading here because then there's detail in the report about, you know, the kind of quality of the data and the, and the, and the coverage and, you know, what the improvements might be in each of these categories because there's improvements needed across the board, as Dr. Wagamak already has said. Um, but, um, uh, it, you know, so, there's, it, so this looks a little bit more filled in than it, than it really is. Um, and so this is a kind of... Just looking at flows, inward and outward flows, if the data is available. 
Um, and, and I think that you know there's data available that cover some information that provides some information in each one of these cells. The big thing that's missing in Europe is into any data on intra-firm trade. So what's happening in, in multinationals and trading in multinationals was missing. But um, uh, and I didn't really see um, a lot of kind of effort right now to fix that problem, except for developing the European business register that Dr. Robin Marker mentioned, which will kind of give you the, the sample frame at least to ask the question um, within Europe. Uh, this is another way of breaking it down by data source. Okay, so I won't, again, I won't walk through this, but uh, um, here's some data we'd like to see. This is a little easier to, to look at, um, is to kind of break down um, international trade by what's arm's length, what's internationally sourced, and within international sourcing, again, this nomenclature thing I think is important, intergroup versus external international sourcing. So we talk about outsourcing, offshoring, insourcing. I mean, I think we need to, and I think that the report with, through a lot of uh, uh, interaction through the editors, both on my own steering committee and, this, and the steering committee within Eurostat, kind of work on kind of getting a, a, a robust nomenclature. Okay, so hopefully this, we can carry this forward from the report, uh, but if not, uh, we just something we, it's, it's exceedingly important to, uh, to work on. Um, as I said, data in, intra-firm trade is, is, is largely missing. There has been research done uh, through kind of uh, microdata linking and other kind of estimation techniques uh, in Europe, and you can see the importance of, uh, of um, uh, large firms uh, in uh, international trade in Europe. And there was a similar study done by some uh, colleagues of mine in, in the U.S., um, which where data is a little bit richer in regard to multinationals. And um, again, you can see this the incredible importance of multinational uh, enterprises in the economy. So these aren't just the top uh, uh, MNEs, and because the data is richer, you're able to kind of look at them as a group. And it's not just trade, but if you look at the R&D line, which is a little bit obscured there, I can kind of pull this back, 75% um, uh, of, uh, of R&D. So again, this is shows the importance of multinationals, but also there's, in here uh, lies an opportunity because the kind of uh, the sample that need, where you need to extract the data is relatively small in, in some degree. So uh, in Europe, um, I think, uh, again, Dr. Rodemacher already mentioned some of these uh, initiatives. There's uh, several initiatives uh, underway to, to fill the gaps. Um, and I, and I think that uh, for each one, I think there's uh, fine-tuning that needs to be done, and this is kind of laid out in, in the report. I won't go through that uh, in detail, but it's a lot of activity uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, on There's a lot of awareness of the, of, uh, the problems, and there's um, a lot of initiatives to, um, to kind of uh, try to fill these data gaps. So these are the kind of barriers uh, and the, and the challenges um, for statistical measurement that kind of economic globalization creates that I've been able to come up with, um, and it's kind of these are and these are generic barriers. This is a barrier that any statistical agency, any in the world, anywhere in the world, would have as a kind of as a minimum. They might have other barriers too. Um, Interagency and international data sharing is diff difficult because of confidentiality. Um, I think that uh, leadership, funding, and political will are kind of a big problem. I mean, when you bring, in my country, when you bring kind of data issues into the legislation, legislative process, you know, people just kind of tune out. It's, a, it's, it's not an exciting, uh, uh, even, if, even if it can be so critically important, it's not an exciting topic, and people want to uh, get to um, exciting topics to kind of raise their profile, unfortunately. So in the political sphere, uh, this is kind of often a kind of um, uh, you know lands with a very quiet thud. Uh, but um, you know, so I, I think that the real well, I want to just say something here. It's not just the kind of 
political kind of uh, process, the un unbeautiful political processes that we have in democracies, but it's also the very kind of unbeautiful uh, you know, power of lobbying. And, and I think that we have to, if we go back to those big companies, we really have to ask ourselves, do they want transparency in, in, on global value chains or not? In the kind of market, a lot of kind of uh, uh, profits and profit taking and environmental regulations and uh, labor regulations get kind of are also in the market and money gets sloshed around and it's a it's it's a benefit for for certain people and, and those those people tend to have a lot of political power. Just had to say that because it's uh, I think probably the 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 elephant or the gorilla or whatever you want to call it in the room. So, but. You know, if data infrastructure, here's the kind of what politicians do like to hear, is that we're going to save money. We're going to cut budgets. We're going to go to lower taxes and lower burden on these, uh, these companies in terms of responding to our, our constant demands for more information. Uh, and if, if a kind of infrastructure can be put in place uh, that can be linked across countries, you can easily, you can conceivably uh, imagine that more can be done with less and uh, burden could be reduced. Okay, so I already mentioned in, uh, information in intergroup uh, trade is missing. I don't think I need to go into why ownership matters. I've been um, talking about that already. Um, this kind of external international sourcing uh, is, a, is a kind of invisible piece. It's not the same as arm's length trade. Um, it's a crucial piece in growing, small but growing piece of global value chains, and we really don't know anything about it except for what we're learning in these kind of pioneering international sourcing surveys. There's been surveys conducted too in the um, in the U.S. The second is, uh, in, is is in the field right now in Canada, and we have a very small survey uh, research survey. Uh, in the U.S. that we uh, just completed last year. But these are just the beginning, and I, and I think that again, if you think about codification and standardization, what we've learned as collectively in Canada, in the U.S., and in, in Europe about international sourcing surveys, about the best way to do it, um, and the best way to kind of build that as instead of a kind of silo, a new silo, which I think it is, as part of a larger uh, framework for. I think that's really we're just at the beginning of that process. Traded services is the kind of beat this drum again and again. Uh, data on services is very weak. Um, and then I think crucially, and I think we are so busy trying to fix the problem in our own backyard, is that this is a global system. So if we don't know what's happening in all of the countries where global value chains are kind of embedded, um, then we will we'll never have a complete picture. Now, the statistical agencies and statistical systems in many countries are weak or even non-existent, and input-output tables are, uh, are defunct or kind of missing in certain countries. And there's uh, been some really interesting work lately to kind of get countries uh, up to speed and to kind of help them uh, develop the system. Now, in there, again, lies an opportunity. You can do the minimum <laughs> a simple system that can actually teach us things that we don't need necessarily, and ways to kind of pare back, simplify, and streamline our statistical systems that are kind of built up and accreted over a century or two centuries of, uh, of uh, institutional and um, uh, kind of, you know, just, you know, you know what I'm saying, I'm sorry, completely out of words there, <laughs> I'm speechless. Um, so, but what's happening in Europe? Well, I mean, I think these kind of data sharing issues are, are, are here in Europe, but by necessity, data sharing is kind of better in Europe than it is. Um, in my country, we have data sharing issues in, with the data, three data agencies inside the country. We have NAFTA, so that was a big deal to kind of get um, a, a nomenclature system in three across the three countries in North America. And when you talk to them about kind of moving forward with the integration, they're like, oh, yeah. We're still getting over NAFTA. It was, it was, that was hard, it, but I, it, you know, people understand what they need to do, but it, it was difficult. So Europe has been at this since 1992, at, or before, as uh, Dr. Water, Watermacher uh, pointed out. And Europe has Eurostat as a kind of umbrella agency to coordinate all this. There is no umbrella agency in North America. There's three you know, data agencies, or well, th three in the US, and then two more uh, in, in 
in Mexico and Canada kind of sitting at the table, you know, trying to, there's nobody uh, uh, to um, arbitrate and uh, coordinate the process. Um, in terms of uh, a system, an integrated system, uh, Europe has the, is developing the European system of business registers. Very, very important and, and promising and innovative. Um, intergroup trade, like I said, uh, the Europe Group Register is under development. I think it's still early days, but very, very important. Um, external international sourcing, as I said, there's the International Sourcing Survey in 2007 and 2012, and hopefully it will be institutionalized. Uh, made improved and made permanent soon. Um, trade and services, you know, I did a study that, like this before of trade and services in the U.S. And, you know, made the same point that Dr. Rodwacker made, you know, 9,000, 16,000, if you get out of the 10-digit, goods, product categories in the U.S. We had, at that time, back in 2006, 17. And now we have, I think, 27. So things have gotten a lot better. But Europe's working with, depending on the survey, you're working with, between 70 and 90, 90 product categories. And if you can get to the CPC level of kind of a balance between goods and, and, and uh, a nice balance of about 150 uh, categories in goods and services, um, you know, that would be a nice, a nice goal, I think. But so far ahead. And again, data quality, compliance, you know, there's, it's, it's really not very good. But um, Europe is ahead of the game here, I think. Um, and I don't see, again, I think there's so much kind of taking care of your own knitting. Um, here, I'm not <laughs> sure of any kind of, uh, kind of out, uh, systematic outreach efforts to uh, developing countries, but this is not just an altruistic process. Again, it's absolutely required. And it can also kind of, um, kind of focus on best practice, on you know, Oakham's kind of law, Oakham's razor, where you just cut out, cut back to the essential um, uh, theoretically, anyway, what, what you would need. I think that's a good lesson to... Uh, so anyway, um, what are the trends? What about employment? Um, and what about innovation? So are these kind of steps that are being taken, are they enough to answer these questions? Or is it just kind of running around with a box of band-aids, you know, sticking them so the silos don't fall apart? I think that, uh, and, I, and I think that anybody, any statistician, anywhere would agree that more needs to be done. So you need to take this kind of enterprise level data uh, related to economic globalization that I've already been kind of talking about over and over again, and it needs to be linked to a full set of enterprise characteristics. So you need to know not just kind of how much is being done, but you need to know which firms are doing it. This is where confidentiality comes in. This is where uh, this kind of microdata linking is so essential. So we need to know, you know, and this is just a short list of the data that resides in. Sorry about the animations. <laughs> keep you awake. <laughs> um, you know, these are some, some. These are generally confidential data that resides often in administrative uh, data sets. And they might not be available. Uh, they may have uh, a host of problems. So let's just talk about how would you take microdata mainstream. So what are the challenges? Well, disappearing data. So these are data that are not um, archived necessarily. Uh, they're not um, uh, uh, maintained when, particularly when you know we have so much change in IT systems. You have the servers from. Five years ago, they go into the recycling bin, and you kind of start with last, you know, last year. So the, the time series are uh, kind of disappearing. Um, you have uh, administrative data that was that's for doing taxes or for environmental compliance or for international trade, and they don't they're not built to talk to each other, and they don't. So the the kind of the process of linking. I mean, I know researchers who've done this. And it's, I think, taking years and years off their life to try to, to make these these links. So it's a it's it's so it needs to be kind of uh, uh, if you're going to really kind of speed up the process and make it robust, the 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 the, uh, the microdata needs to be designed in from the beginning from to be used. 
So obviously time series uh, difficult to cons construct, and that's not only because of incompatible and disparate data, but time series are difficult to, to construct because we try to have to put burden on certain companies by interviewing them over and over again. Um, so we switch companies, and then we don't have a time series. So uh, I think that kind of automatic reporting um, uh, and kind of other ways to reduce um, burden are ways to kind of get around that. How am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yellow, 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 yellow is what? Five minutes. You, you, no, you oh, are out of time. Five minutes ago. You are five minutes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. well, um, maybe I need to kind of speed this up. So I, I have a list here of, um, maybe I do. Uh, you know, obviously these, all these problems need to be fixed. <laughs> this is a huge undertaking. Uh, it's, a, it's a coordination uh, problem of a, a very large magnitude. Um, that's all I'll say there. I will also say that um, the institutional um, basis in Europe for dealing with these problems is extremely robust. So we have things like the modernization program, MEETS, uh, framework regulation for integration, FRIPS. So that all sounds really, really good. Um, there's a kind of research on kind of data warehousing and linking. Uh, there's a, a range of ESS nets that are covering the issues that we've just been talking about. So Europe is really uh, understands th these problems um, and is kind of uh, has a range of activities to try to deal with them. But I still think that the solutions are only incremental and partial. Um, I think that by kind of fixing uh, different pieces of it, the, the risk there is to increase respondent burden, because you're going to add a little bit here, add a little bit there, and very little get, get, tends to get taken away or automated. So, you're, and then, you, you know, harmonization inside of Europe is not the same as global harmonization. I think that's important. So, what we need is, and this is the kind of uh, end, you know, of my, of, my, of my report and my remarks today, is an integrated uh, international data platform at first, at the European level, and eventually beyond that. So this is an integrated solution that fully leverages uh, uh, existing resources, you know, harmonizes data structure, brings in new data sources and analytic tools, so you can flexibly produce up-to-date, disclosable statistics uh, and indicators um, that can be tailored to the needs of policymakers. I'm reading from my slide, I'm sorry, uh, but this is exactly what I want to say and researchers on an as-needed basis. So they we're talking about user-defined tables as well. So how do you get from confidential siloed <coughs> data to user-defined on-the-fly uh, tables? Sounds impossible, but I really don't think it is. I think that the, um, uh, the kind of elements that are needed are, are listed here. Um, so these are all, again, spelled out in the, in the report, and, th and this is a really a, a model and a vision where the, the confidential data continues to ride, reside with the owner, but the links are there to kind of draw the non-confidential data out uh, and, and, and use kind of these kind of big data tools to uh, uh, mine uh, the data that's on the other side of the firewall. And then there's a bunch of kind of uh, uh, technical kind of pieces for metadata, et cetera, that would need to be developed. And then I think that the skills for these need to be, uh, to develop these things, need to be developed probably inside of Eurostat. So not the system is built inside of Eurostat, but Eurostat needs, probably needs kind of a big data group, um, a big database group uh, that can rival uh, what's going on in companies like, you know, Amazon, Google, and, uh, and Facebook, for example, uh, where masses of data can be kind of, uh, processed and delivered to users while protecting uh, confidentiality. So the inputs are kind of everything we've been talking about. The outputs are the, are the things I just mentioned. Um, I here's Well, I wanted to kind of go back here. Um, this last bullet here, uh, private data, logistics, ERP data, etc. Again, we go back to those three to 5,000 companies they really have a lot of information about their own operations and the operations of their suppliers. 
here's just a quick uh, a picture of my friend's um, uh, laptop computer. When, this is on the tag that came with the computer. This is just a tracking of the of where the computer. It's a little journey from uh, Guangzhou to her house in Medford. <laughs> so this is the kind of detail that kind of gets generated every single day uh, en masse inside of these corporate systems. This is a very small taste. So I think that you know Europe is it an, is it has a natural leadership position in to solve some of these problems. Um, First of all, again, because it has Eurostat as an umbrella organization. Um, and I think that Europe can be an innovator here. Um, I think a European IDP uh, can kind of show others uh, how this works and also uh, convince them to join if it's, uh, if it's, if it's successful. Um, you know, there really is a growing information gap between what's in the statistical agencies and what's in the big companies. And that really puts policymakers at a huge disadvantage in terms of negotiating regulations uh, and, and just collecting taxes and things like that. Um, so there has to be a kind of way. So what are the interests for MNEs in participating in something like this? Obviously, MNEs know about their own operations, but they don't know where they fit. And, you know, this is the kind of business, this giant business called consulting, is based on this kind of information gap where companies want to know how they're doing. You know, they're just desperate to know. So I think that's, you can't discount that. There's other companies, and I've named some of them, that have a lot of external data about everybody else. Now that's a trickier, that's a trickier play. But I think there are, um, uh, uh, deals that could be struck where some of the some of the ec the data that's coming out of the system can be delivered uh, to kind of into into a, as a search engine result, for example, where it's a kind of a win-win. Um, so the priorities are listed in the report, and I won't go over them here. I'll leave them up um, in case we want to uh, kind of reference any of them during the question and answer period. But I just wanted to say mainly. Thank you.